This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Robert Woodson, author of Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers, discusses how American history is being replaced with a polarizing version. He's interviewed by Harvard Law professor and author Randall Kennedy. I look forward very much to our discussion of your book, Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers. Why don't we begin by your telling the audience what you are offering in this book and why they should want it? Well, we were, wrote this in response to the New York Times uh, publication of 1619, a series of essays by Black journalists and others led by Nicole Hannah-Jones where in in essence it redefined America's birthday from 1776 to 1619 uh, at the the time when slaves, 20 slaves first arrived on the shores of Virginia. And it goes on to say that the Revolutionary War was fought to defend slavery. Uh, It also made other false claims, but it also tried to redefine America as systemically racist and that all whites are villains uh, to, to be, and, and that all blacks are, vi- are victims. And uh, it offers a very dire uh, uh, picture of the country. It also makes the false claims that uh, the current uh, con- challenges facing many in the black community today, out of wedlock, birth crime, are a direct legacy of or the shadow of slavery and Jim Crow. And so um, since the messenger here was black, we thought the, the counter narrative should be also uh, uh, authored by blacks. And so, but we did not want to offer a point by point debate or rebuttal. We wanted to offer an inspirational and an aspirational alternative narrative um, that acknowledges what 1619, that, that slavery has been underreported <laughs> and, and poorly examined. We acknowledge that. But the conclusions that we reach are very different than that which uh, is, is, is articulated in 1619. And so we brought together a group of scholars, uh, uh, journalists and activists, um, different ideological stripes, um, and so we authored these essays uh, to offer, to, to, to establish the fact that 1776 is the birthday of America and the, the, the values of our founders, no matter how flawed, has been the, the foundation upon which Blacks were able to uh, survive slavery and discrimination, the foundation of family, faith, and an attitude of self-determination. And, and so we, uh, we felt that uh, it was important for this book to be written to give an alternative vision to America about uh, the plight of Blacks. We should never be defined by uh, slavery or Jim Crow. We were more than that. Tell us about your um, title. Let me, let me read the title again. Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers. Now, there's a lot there. Let's begin with Red, White, and Black. What what is Red, White, and Black supposed to signify? It signifies that Black Americans are a part of this nation, that we are not some, some, some species set apart. And therefore, um, we, we claim this heritage and Blacks fought in every war in the country and died. Uh, my father was a veteran of the First World War and died as a result of war-related wounds. So we're supposed to signify that, America, that Black Americans are an integral part of this nation and deserve to be so. But we also know that there have been people who have profited off of racial grievance in, and, and uh, in fact, I left the civil rights movement in the 60s because I believe that a lot of those who suffered and sacrificed most did not benefit from the change. And that the, I remember uh, demonstrating outside of a Wyatt Laboratories 
and on and when they desegregated they hired nine black phd chemists and when we asked these brothers and sisters to join us they said we got these jobs because we were qualified not because of the sacrifices of people who were janitors hairdressers factory workers who did not benefit I realized after two or three such encounters that I was in the wrong struggle. In fact, I have a, uh, a headline in my office that was written by uh, the seat, uh, late Bill Raspberry, uh, a headline in 1965, October 29th, poor Negroes did not benefit from the gains of the civil rights movement. And it goes on to list uh, the, the other reason. And so I believe that that there has been a, a, a bifurcation of the black community that existed since then and continues to this day. Okay, let's, I, I still wanna stick on your title for a bit, uh, Rescuing American History. Yes, American history as it was told, as it is uh, unfolds in 1619, does not really talk about uh, uh, a true authentic picture of black. There are, the blacks are never defined by slavery. So some of our essays, for instance, uh, talk, looks at the records of six major plantations at the end of slavery to look at what was happening in the family. They found that 70% of slave families had a man and a woman raising children. And this tradition of two parent households continued for a century um, afterwards. Also, when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. When, when the, uh, during that period, the, the lit literacy rate of blacks was like 75%. And in less than 50 years, that number reduced to 25% to the point where when the government sent workers south to aid the black community in becoming literate, they found that there was very little that they could do because the mediating institutions that have been established in the black church was already uh, uh, attacking that problem. And they found nowhere in the history of the world that a people move from a 75% illiteracy rate down to 25% in such a short period of time. And so in our essays, we also talk about how we achieved uh, against the odds under very difficult circumstances. Uh, for instance, in 1929, uh, in Chicago's uh, Bronzeville section, when we were denied access to financing from banks, venture capital, Blacks established 731 Black-owned businesses in 1929 with $100 million in real estate assets. In almost every major city, there was a kind of a Black Wall Street but these stories of triumph in the face of opposition are not uh, are shared with uh, the public. And so these essays were intended to, to sh share new insight. I spoke at the University of Talladega uh, in, in, in Louisiana, and when I shared with these students the histories of Blacks who achieved against the odds, some of the students came up to me in tears and said, Mr. Woodson, why don't our leaders ever tell us some stories of triumph in the face of oppression? Why aren't we ever told this? Um, just to finish it out, so you rescuing American history, you want to rescue American history, and then from revisionists and race hustlers. Yes. Revisionists and race hustlers. Sounds sounds um, pretty uncomplimentary. Sounds pretty derogatory, frankly. Tell us what you mean by that. What I mean by it, there are people who profit from the suffering of people. Those today who are denigrating the police and 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 derive and and they do not and as a consequence. We have seen a rise in violence in these communities, but the violence is not, not uh, occurring in the communities where a lot of these advocates who are defunding the police abide. And so I spend 80% of, of the people that we serve at the Woodson Center live in those at-risk communities. They are the ones 
who 80% are black said they are not supportive of defund the police. But a lot of the so-called social justice warriors campaign on, 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 um, on deri de attacking the police and they make generous incomes now uh, providing consulting services to school systems, to corporations in the name of equity training, uh, 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 all, uh, uh, racial audits, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are being poured into what I call the race grievance industry. And in fact, if you look at the poverty programs over the past 20 or 50 years, I did a lot of research on where that money went. $22 trillion, 80, 70 cents of every dollar spent on poverty programs did not go to the poor. It went to those who served the poor and they are the professional service providers. So we created a commodity out of poor people where the question is which problems are fundable, not which ones are, are, are solvable. So, so that's why after $22 trillion, blacks running these major urban centers, running these programs, why do we have the deterioration of these cities if, if, the, if poverty and race were the solution, then why in the face of $22 trillion expended, blacks running most of those systems that are failing, then they obviously just concentrating on race is not the answer. Now, just a moment ago and in the book, um, you talk about race grievance and you, you talk about the perpetrators of race grievance. And Mike, are there circumstances in which voicing a racial grievance is the right thing to do? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I fought in the civil rights movement when they were the legitimate racial issues. You know, I've been to jail. I know what that's like. I lived in the segregated South and I was in the military. I have 12 credits from the University of Miami when I could not walk on the campus because of segregation. And, we, and, and what we demanded then, and also I know that if a black committed a crime against another black in the South, often they weren't even punished for it. And we said that that diminished black life. But if a black committed a crime against a white person, they would be treated severely. So we wanted to even the playing field. We said we should be judged by a single standard of justice. And that's what we fought for. But now this is changing to the point where when, when uh, uh, 8,000 blacks are killing other blacks and we don't, there's no outrage. But when 18 blacks are killed by like in George Floyd's case, we treat it as if it's a, a, an epidemic and there's out, outrage and, and about it. And as a consequence, it means that we then, we say that the police departments are an extension of, of white supremacy. And now uh, we vilify them. And as a consequence, they step back. But, but, but a lot of the so-called leaders, they live in secure communities. They live in buildings where there is security or gated communities. So they, many of the people who are advocating uh, defund the police and vilifying them don't have to live with the consequence of their advocacy. Now, um, you, you indicated in your, in your last answer, you're a person who lived, you know, a substantial part of your life under Jim Crow segregation. If you're from the Deep South, you have seen up close racial oppression. Yes. Okay. Now, and, and, and in your book, in your book, uh, your, you know, your, your opening essay, there are places you, you, you say, listen, I'll just read. You say, slavery and discrimination undeniably are a tragic part of our nation's history. And, and, and in other places, you, you, you say that. Um, do you think 
that that part of the story, that part of the American chronicle, do you think that that part of the story is underplayed? I mean, you absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Well, absolutely. El- elaborate. I mean, I mean under what I, circumstances I, 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 today no, is that really underplayed? Think, yeah, we need to tell the complete story of the horrors of slavery, of the horrors of discrimination. We need to tell that story. But I, but I believe that conditions that existed then are not the conditions that exist now. Okay. I give the example in my talk sometime about a farmer coming to a stream pulling, uh, with his mule intact. And they get to that stream and it's three feet high going at 20 miles an hour. And he pulls him in and they get washed down the stream. They come to the same place a year later, the stream is six inches. But the mule refuses to go in because the mule has good memory but poor judgment. Many of us have good memories and we act as if conditions have not improved since the 60s. And so we, 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 we engage in uh, uh, strategies where we are uh, acting as if conditions have not improved. That our strategic position should adjust to our strategic uh, circumstance. And that's not happening. Okay, but I mean, I can imagine someone saying, listen, don't, don't we need to distinguish between what one thinks would be useful, prudent, you know, productive policy today, race policy and, you know, social policy in general? I can imagine somebody saying that, you know, that's one conversation. The conversation about history, though they overlap, it, 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 it's still an independent issue. And I can imagine someone saying, with respect to American history, it is still the case that too many Americans, particularly white Americans, are not sufficiently educated about some of the aspects that you just talked about. We, again, we don't need to go back to slavery. We, can, you know, we don't have to go back that far. We can go back to subjects which are in your lifetime. Yeah, you know, what would you say to the person who said, listen, our beef is that too many people do not know that, you know, in 1941, Black people didn't even have the right to fight for democracy. And what we want is for, you know, our educational system to more fully educate everybody about the fullness of American history it's good sides, but it's ugly sides, too. What would you say to that person? Absolutely. I would say we need to do it. But we also need to say to ourselves that we are not defined solely by external barriers. Okay. That it is, it's dangerous and, and I think lethal to say to young people today that if you are dropping out of school, it's not your fault. If you are carrying guns and destroying one, it's not your fault. If you're having children out of wedlock and not caring for, it's not your fault. There's nothing more lethal than telling a person that they are exempt from any personal responsibility. And many of the people who are supposed to be social justice advocates and progressives continue this drumbeat of saying to young blacks that they are not responsible until white people change that little you can expect your life to improve. And, and that puts the only risk on white people to determine the agency of black people. And that's a dangerous, I think, self-defeating message for people to say that somehow my destiny is determined by what others have done. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. People are motivated when you give them victories that are possible, not constantly reminding them of injuries to be avoided. We... Go ahead. I'm sorry. And so, and, I, and so what we do is, for instance, we talk about the education gap. In 1920, in the South, the education gap between whites and blacks was three years. It was eighth grade for white, fifth grade for blacks. Okay, what was our response? Julius Rosenwald partnered with Booker T. Washington in an essay we have, and they built 5,000 Rosenwald Booker T. schools. Book, uh, Rosenwald put up half the money, four million, and blacks raised the other four million, and they participated. As a consequence of the 
in the Rosenwald schools, in 1940, the education gap closed within six months. If we were able to close it when, when our classrooms were crowded, we would have to use textbooks and half the budgets of white schools. If we were able to accomplish this closing of the education gap in the midst of virulent racism, when racism was enshrined in law, the question is why can't we do it today in institutions run by our own people for the past 40 years with a per capita expenditures as high as it is for an education? Isn't, don't, don't we deserve a right to have these questions at least discussed? Now, it seems to me there's a paradox in what you just said, because on the one hand, you're very much in the, um, the school of, 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 of Black history in which I was socialized. I associated with people like Carter G. Woodson and, um, uh, you know, people who focused on, you know, what we've done, what we've been able to overcome, you know, first. So, you know, you get your Ebony magazine and every month they'd have, you know, the first this, the first that telling people about what we have been able to accomplish. And I think there's a lot of good to that. Here's, here's, here's a question I have for you, though. Isn't it true that in the past half century, there have also been a lot of firsts? I mean, wasn't there a lot of achievement in every phase of the civil rights movement, the, both those phases that you know, you embrace, and frankly, phrases maybe that you were critical of. I mean, Black people, it seems to me, have been coming on and have been making way, have been making advances, <laughs> including in the last several decades, including people who have ideas that you criticize. I mean, would you agree to that? Sure, but it's important to recognize that, the, uh, that the, the biggest issue that I have is that when you generalize about a, any group of people and then you try to apply remedies, the benefit goes to those at the top instead of at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you cannot generalize about black people any more than you can white people, Hispanics. And when you do, I'll give you an example right now. And Coca-Cola in, uh, in its gestures towards uh, 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 responding to a charge of institutional racism. So what is the remedy uh, that Coca-Cola and other companies propose? Making certain that a third of all of the attorneys <laughs> who serve the company are black. Uh, Twitter, all those other companies. Tell me how the hell that helps some black woman on public assistance living in public housing. How does it do that? The same with women. The, the Me Too movement uh, uh, got them animated by a black woman seeking to help other black women in New York who were abused come together as in a mutual support. So wealthy middle-class white women came in and seized it and made it the Me Too movement. And now the concentration is on some white woman, you know, getting abused on the casting couch in Hollywood. And so what are the remedies for that? Well, women, we will, uh, in California, women will be required to be serving on boards of directors. Women who will be in corporate uh, position. Tell me now how that helps the thousands of black and Hispanic women that are in our prisons or in our communities. But we have just has an agenda to help women and so as long as we focus on groups, you, we will not help the people that I care about most, and that is the least of God's children. And, and the other uh, problem with focusing on race is that when evil wears a black face, it does not get challenged. I'll give you an example. Geraldo Rivera, several years ago, did a two-hour documentary on sexual abuse of women in prisons. Every one of the victimizers he interviewed were black. Every one of the victims were black. 
It didn't even provoke a single day of discussion. Not a single day. Because evil has to wear a white face before it attracts any attention. And as long as that continues, it's always going to be detrimental to. That's why I think we ought to be emphasizing upward mobility of low-income people instead of looking at life through the prism of race because it means people like you and me will benefit and people who uh, look like us in, in these high crime, drug infested neighborhoods, they will not benefit, but we can walk around all proud and, and look at what accomplished we've accomplished, but it's coming at the expense of others in that community. You know, one of the things that's interesting about what you just said and what you just said you accentuate very much at the very end of the introduction to the book, you quote Adolf Reed. And you quote Adolf Reed, and Adolf, he, he says, um, identity is very much the ideology of the professional management class. They prefer to talk about identity over capitalism and the inequities of capitalism. We have an atrocious wealth gap in this country. It's not a black and white wealth gap. It's a wealth gap. And then he says some more. What I find interesting is, you know, a lot of people, I think, would call you, and maybe you call yourself, a, a, a conservative. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, many of the people that you laud, you, you laud their sort of their entrepreneurial verve. There's, a, there's much about your profile that I think many people would, 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 would type as conservative. Yet, you quote Adolf Reed. Adolf Reed calls himself a socialist. And he, in this dimension anyway, would very much agree with you and actually say that, you know, his part of his criticism of the civil rights movement would be that it was, you know, yeah, it, it opened doors, you, you know, for people like you, for people like me, but it didn't do as much as he would have liked for who William Julius Wilson calls the truly disadvantaged. What have you got to say about labels? I mean, it's sort of an interesting thing. On the one hand, you're, uh, you know, viewed as a conservative. On the other hand, you're embracing the truly disadvantaged and you're criticizing people for not helping out enough the truly disadvantaged. Your, ex all of that. your explanation says it all. Because I, I don't define myself as a conservative. I define my, my political philosophy as radical pragmatism. I am a cardiac Christian <laughs> who is a radical pragmatist. I believe in, and, and, and all of us, someone said, it doesn't matter what people call you, it's what you respond to that's important. And we all have reference groups. My reference groups are low-income people that I have served all of my life. 80% of my closest friends have letters in front of their names, not in back of their names, such as X this and X that. And, 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 and for the past few years, we have, we have uh, convened people like this from all over the country, and not once, they're black, they're white, they're red, not once did the issue of ra racial antagonism come up, because most of the people in need in these communities are more concerned about their brokenness and their strategies towards redemption than they are political labels. So uh, I will support anybody that puts in place policies and practices that elevates the least of God's children. And that will never be done as long as we try to do this by looking at people through racial categories. The issue of America today is more class than it is race. I brought together J.D. Vance and Clarence Page. Clarence Page wouldn't be considered a, a conservative. Or Bernard Anderson, my good friend Bernie, who is a part of our movement. I deliberately stayed out of politics because if you go to any state in the union, 
and go into a low income community, you cannot tell which political party is on power. Bill Bennett said, when liberals look at the poor and blacks, they see a sea of victims and conservatives see a sea of aliens. And so the issue is that I am a radical pragmatist. All I want to know is whether or not the policies and practices you promote have the consequence of improving the lot of the least of these. What are you doing there, like, like people in prison? You know, don't tell me that a woman in prison somehow is on par with a woman who's with a PhD going to work for a company and we are promoting uh, 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 remedies that, that helps one at the expense of the other. But as long as we look through it through the prism of race, we will al always have the, 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 the inequity because we will, and so we've got to be able to, de the goal of the Woodson Center is to de-racialize race because as long as we are compelled to look at each other through the prism of race, the more, uh, the deeper, more uh, troublesome problems that we're facing go unaddressed. Okay, now, I think that there are a lot of folks who actually would agree with what you say, but who also would agree with large parts of the people that you criticize pretty harshly. And I have a question for you. Why do you, for instance, you know, you use this term in your title, race hustler, or you talk about the purveyors of racial grievance. I mean, you know, the, the black community has people who think different things. You agree with some of them. You disagree with some of them. There's pluralism of thought within the black community. What would you say to someone who said in reaction to your book, you know, I agree with a lot of what Mr. Woodson says, but I think that he does himself a disservice by um, putting down in a you know quite personal way people with whom he disagrees. How would you respond to that? I would say I, I try to approach people in a way so there's dark. I'm not interested in demeaning anybody. I don't think that's the way forward. I, I've had, you know, there's no one that I try to demean, but, but I have to be candid and I have to be truthful. And that if somebody is doing something that is harmful to somebody, uh, then I've got to speak out. I, I have to speak out about this. I have, I have been involved inside of institutions where millions of dollars have been given to help the poor and I personally witnessed it time and time again, how that bait and switch game occurs. And, and I'm, I'm going to write, uh, and, and I guess this is what bothers me, is when, when you have Blacks who betray poor Blacks, there's never any outcry about this. Kwame Kirkpatrick, the mayor of Detroit, who for years have been stealing money from poor people in that city, and he was able to run successfully for re-election using the race defense. Mm -hmm. And there are thousands of, uh, of low-income pensioners now who are who are have their pension funds are short because of the 40 people he had as a part of his criminal empire who were in, went to prison. There's no outcry in the black community of that. As far as I'm concerned, someone like Kwame Kirkpatrick and others who use their positions of trust to enrich themselves at the expense of, of, of poor people are worse than bigots. To me, they are traitors. A traitor is somebody who you trust and they violate that trust to, in violation of you. So as far as I'm concerned, don't tell me that some bigot that who uh, is, is in my enemy, I would say, the, more, the greater enemy is people you trust who violate that trust. That's what, so that if, if, if that offends people, then so be it. Okay, but I mean, 
the, the example that you just used was the example of a person who, you know, I mean, he committed crimes. He was he was a person who was deceptive and and and, and stealing for goodness sakes. He was corrupt. Um, and so that, that, that's not the sort of thing I was thinking about. What I was thinking about, let me let me tell you, uh, Mr. Woodson. So I'm going to go autobiographical here. My father, my father, Henry H. Kennedy Sr. was a man from uh, Louisiana. He was born in 1917. He saw, you know, the horrors of racial oppression in the Deep South. He was a man who believed very much in personal responsibility and the responsibility of people to make it regardless. And he did. He, he, he married my mother in Columbia, South Carolina. They were part of the Great Migration. They came north. They raised three children, all three children, college graduates, gainfully employed. My my folks were, you know, church going folks. I think that if you you know they're they're both people of blessed memory. But if you had met them, I bet that you would like them. I would love them. At the same time, let me say this about my father. My father never forgave the United States of America for what he viewed as its betrayal of black people. And for him, I think that the sort of the the place where this crystallized, he was a soldier. He was a soldier during World War II. And he saw the United States of America betray black people in uniform. And he never got over that. Now, I'm not saying that he I'm not I'm not saying that he was right. I'm not saying that he was wrong. I'm simply saying that's what he thought. And what I, I'm and I'm saying that he, he there's there's elements of what you say in which you two would be high fiving. But there's also elements in what he believed that is very much in sync with the 1619 project and the, and the people that you're criticizing. So, I mean, Black America is very pluralistic, you know, and so what do we do? Okay, but let me, let's, let's just spend the rest of this time talking about solutions, because I didn't write the book. We didn't do this as a confrontational instrument. Okay. We did it, we did it to say to people, like, did you see the movie um, uh, Hidden, Hidden Figures? Right? Yes, yes. You remember that I, I was in the space program, flying test control. There was a moment in there when Kathleen Johnson said, we're looking for how do you move from an elliptical orbit to a a hyperbolic orbit? She said, maybe we're looking in the wrong place. She went back and got a book on Euclidean geometry and applied it. So maybe we need to go back and look at what we did successfully under worse conditions Mm -hmm. for a clue as to how we can apply some of those old values to a new reality. So what the Woodson Center is proposing is that we need to call a moratorium on whining about white folks. Mm-hmm. And let's come together and learn from how we were able to build hotels uh, in, or a hundred universities and schools back then. How uh, 20 blacks were born slaves and died millionaires. Robert Smalls even went back and purchased a plantation on which he was a slave and took in the family of the slave master as an act of radical grace. And there are other examples. Your dad lived by the principles that, but despite his feelings, that's what we're talking about. So the, what we wrote these essays to inspire people to, to use it as a, as a foundation to rebuild our community. That's what we want to do, not to engage in a debate about whether, no, we ought to be coming together and talk about how we can rebuild. The leading cause of death among kids in this inner city is homicide. In Appalachia, the leading cause of death is uh, prescription drug. In Silicon Valley, the teenage suicide rate is six times the national average. So what we're going to be doing, we have 2,500 Black mothers, voices of Black mothers who lost their children to urban violence. They are supportive of the police. 
that come together for mutual aid and support. We are gonna bring them together with those Appalachian mothers and also with the mothers from, from um, Silicon Valley. But, we, but and so that we can discuss strategies to fill that empty hole in the hearts of our children that is causing them to devalue life to the point where they wanna take their own or take someone else's. So these are the more critical problems we're facing, but we can't do that if we're constantly divided by race. So that's why the Woodson Center in 1776 wants to deracialize race so that we can use our energies and our, and our resources and our best thinking about how do we arrest the, 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 the moral and spiritual freefall that is consuming us and destroying our children. I was very happy to hear you mention Robert Smalls. Like I, I was born in South Carolina, so you were talking about a, a South Carolinian, <laughs> and I, 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 I like that. In your book, there's certain figures, and in, in fact, in, in, your, in your discussion thus far, you've mentioned certain figures, and two really stand out. Um, one is Frederick Douglass. You, you, you quote Douglas a number of times and, you know, Douglas, the, the, the talk about talk, well, up from slavery. The other person that you talk about, of course, a good, or you mention with tremendous respect, Booker T. Washington, who, of course, wrote up from slavery. Um, who are others, let's say, in the post- World War II era, since 1945, who would you, if somebody came up to you and said, listen, I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, it's, it's resonating with me, who are people, they could either be journalists, they could be historians, they could be political scientists, they could be whatever, you know, thinkers, who, who are the people that you would urge people to read and pay attention to? Well, some of them are my contemporaries. Uh, I really think Pastor Buster Soros in Somerset, New Jersey would certainly be one. Frank Reed in Baltimore. There are a number of, most of them are past. I have a whole list of grassroots leaders, Willie Peterson in Cincinnati, Ohio. Most of the leaders are not national figures. They're local. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of, uh, there's a, a one woman that who's deceased now, Bertha Gilkey. She's profiled on 60 Minutes. Uh, she went into a public housing development and turned it around to the point where the drug dealers were driven out and market rate housing was built right across the street. Kimmy Gray in Washington, D.C., another deceased local leader. And so um, I would, there are hundreds of, of, of inspiring grassroots leaders and pastors who are doing phenomenal work rebuilding Corey Brooks in, in Chicago. There are, are thousands of indigenous leaders who are what I call antibodies and Joseph's. My book, The Triumphs of Joseph, you know, Joseph was important because even though he was treated unjustly like your father, he never succumbed to bitterness. And he ended up saving not only his brothers who betrayed him, but also the Egyptians who enslaved him. There's an example of radical grace. And so it is important for people not to get caught up in resentment uh, because uh, hatred and resentment and animosity consumes you. As some said it's like, it's like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> and so, what we're trying to emphasize in this book, we wanted to inspire people to come together to look beyond race and focus more on upward mobility of those at the bottom and just use our talents uh, instead of always fighting each other or, well, I don't want to engage in the tribal warfare that is looking today, but there are people who profit off of, of, of antagonism and they are the race hustlers. There are legitimate people who know better, who don't act better. And I call them racial hustlers. If it angers them, fine. 
But if it provokes this kind of discussion, then I've accomplished something. Now, one of the things that's interesting, so I asked you for names, and it seems to me the one issue lurking is the whole question of what do we call, what do we consider leadership? Because I asked you the question and you went to local people. Um, frankly, I bet that the number, I bet most of the people that you mentioned, many of the people in our audience will not have heard of right. unless they were in that locale. Right. And so and in fact, you use the term indigenous people. You talk about people sort of being in a locale, local people. And I think there's a, a there's a sort of a disconnect because oftentimes when people, you know, f- frankly, in my mind, uh, I was, you know, when people ask about leaders, they're thinking about national leaders. They're thinking about people who are at, you know, universities like mine. They're thinking of people who are in the big newspapers, the, you know, the big time uh, columnists. And so the whole question, it seems to me, one of the things that you're getting at is you actually want to nurture and also shine more light on and lift up a different type of leader. It's not that right. you're against these other people, you know, fine and dandy. But there's another type of leader who it seems to me you're saying doesn't get enough play, maybe doesn't get enough support. What what react to that? You are absolutely right. That's what I want to do. We need to really study. uh, In other words, the the principle that operate in our market economy should operate in our social economy. Only 3% of the people in our market economy are entrepreneurs, but they generate 70% of all the jobs. Mm-hmm. So innovation comes from within, and they happen to be C students, not A students. Smart A students come back to universities and teach. C students come back and endow. <laughs> <laughs> because smart people have to have all the answers before they act, and when they act, the opportunity is gone. <laughs> and so I look at that same paradigm and say that if somebody was able to for instance, we went into an area of, of Washington, D.C. called Benning Terrace, where there's 53 mur- gang murders in a five square block area in two years. I trained five social entrepreneurs in Washington called the Alliance of Concerned Men, ex-offenders, that have the trust and confidence of the community. And they, uh, uh, and a 12-year-old boy was killed, and I said, God has chosen it. They brought in 16 young men to my office downtown in separate vans. And we worked out a truce, and, and they took the same young men who were terrorizing the community and, ret- and turned them into ambassadors of peace. And as a consequence, we didn't have a single gang murder in 12 years. And we, we harvested these principles that we learned from this and have now applied it to other cities. So that's what I mean by leadership is local, and it occurs the way, uh, for instance, uh, Steve Jobs created a, an instrument that now 60% of Apple's income, but it didn't exist eight years ago <laughs> because that's how local innovation can occur. I'm hoping if, if local grassroots leaders are able to stop 53 murders, reduce it to them, that it will provide a, 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 a test bed, a model for what can happen throughout the nation. How do you scale something up like that? I mean, you know, we, the United States of America is so huge. We're talking 300 million people over this gigantic land mass, all of these cities, all of the, you know, the different, well, we've got the cities, but we've also got rural areas. We've got problems everywhere. How do we mobilize the social Financial, all of the different sorts of resources that would be necessary, that would be needed to effectively address the sorts of problems that are most on your mind. That is the best question because that 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 is that is where we are we are at this point where we are seeking that kind of help from corporate America and from others who know how to grow a business. We have a group in Washington D.C. the Alliance of Concerned Men. 
that for three to four months, they went into one of the most violent areas of Washington, D.C., and for three or four months, there was not a single violent incident because of their intervention. We ought to have been racing to there with resources and technical assistance to answer that question, to say, let's find out what you did, how you did it. Let's provide you all the resources you need and the, and the technical skill that it takes. The people who know how to market to a larger audience, we want to partner with them so that we and the public relations aspect we ought to be mobilizing around a spark of innovation that occurs in a local community. So that's one of the cha challenges we're facing. We're at the point now where we are seeking, reaching out to people with resources, not just money, but the wherewithal to partner with us because we are, we, we are social entrepreneurs, but we need to join together with business entrepreneurs so that we can answer just that question. Why, you know, you mentioned business, you mentioned companies. What about government? Government, as far as I'm concerned, got us in this mess. <laughs> but government does have a role, but not a leading role. Because in order for entrepreneurs to function and these social, you need the maximum amount of flexibility so that you can address that. In fact, you can uh, look on. If you, if you were, your listeners were to go on YouTube and get and put in violence free zone Milwaukee, you will see an example of how one is able to go into, and, and also, this is a commercial from my other book, Lessons from the Least of These, is a book that I published that has 10 Woodsonian principles that answers the questions that you just raised. How to identify legitimate grassroots Josephs how to provide assistance to them, and then how can we rebuild our culture from the bottom up and the inside out? Mr. Woodson, we, we've, we only have time for one last sally. So let me just put this to you. Is there anything that you would have liked for me to have asked you? Is there anything sort of, you know, in your mind about this subject that you would like to convey to our audience before we have to wrap it up and go? Yes, I, I want to say that there's a real urgency for us to end this racial strife and tribalism because if blacks are able to play race, so can white people. And I, I, I think that unless we were able to to push back against this racialization and pushing these limits, it's not going to be long before whites begin to respond in kind. And I think that we could be, we could face violence in America on a level that we've never seen before. So there's a certain urgency that we have to move beyond race. And it's, I just think there's an urgency to what we are about. Of course, there would be many people who would jump in right now and say, what do you mean, uh, you know, whites might start using race? Whites have been using race and are using race. They are, whites are not going, you know, it's very interesting whenever, and this is where, where we, we're not truthful. Whenever I hear about an Asian being racially assaulted in California somewhere, and they don't mention the race of the perpetrator, I know it's a black person. 80 to 90% of the attacks on Asians are being done by blacks, but the press will not report that because it does not fit the racial narrative. And it's, it's a shame that, 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 that we, are, we are being misled because there's, a, is, there's an incentive not to be truthful about what is happening in the country. But whites are not uh, attacking blacks. We are killing our children. They are not coming into our community shooting our children. 90, 94% of the murders being taken are blacks on blacks. On that note, and of course we could go on for hours. This is a huge subject. But thank you very much for this conversation. 
And I look forward some time to being able to meet you face to face. I hope so, too. And I, you were a good interviewer. Thank you very much. Be well. Same here. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. Be sure to check out our Q&A podcast for intriguing, hour-long conversations with people who are making things happen. This week, Jessica Dulong talks about her book, Saved at the Seawall, which tells the story of the largest and fastest maritime evacuation in history, which happened on September 11th, 2001, when over 500,000 people were taken off Manhattan Island by boat. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts.